Hey guys, welcome back to another Playdate tutorial. This time it is all about the crank. To start, here is an example of a project setup that we will use. Very basic, it just moves the cube to the right of the screen. Note that we are not using the crank yet, but if we run the code, the cube moves by itself. Now we'll start with the most basic way to read crank input using the playdate.getCrankChange function. This function returns two values, change and accelerated change. Think of them as the amount you crank, but accelerated change is different because it is skewed by how fast the player is cranking, when change is just a static amount in degrees that the player has moved the crank. A side note, I'm dividing by 100 simply because I want the values to be smaller than, say, 300 degrees, 270 degrees, values like that. And if we run the code, you can see that cranking it in a positive direction increases our cube speed, and cranking it in a negative direction decreases our cube speed. If we switch to using accelerated change, you'll see that moving the crank faster dramatically increases the speed. If we want a more controlled way to measure crank rotations, we can use the get crank ticks function. But one important thing to note about this function is it requires importing corelib slash crank before it will work. Let me take a second to explain how this works. Get crank tick 6 will split a full 360 degrees rotation of the crank into 6 even parts. Each time the crank is turned past one of those parts, the function will return a value of 1. If the crank is between two parts, it will return 0. And if the crank is turned in the reverse for a complete part, it will return negative 1. So in our example, that means each full rotation, 360 degrees, is broken into six even parts. And each time the player rotates enough to complete one of those six parts, the speed is increased by 1. And each time the player rotates in the negative direction, the speed is decreased by 1. As you can see, when we test our crank, the console only prints when we make it past one of our six section parts. And when you go in the negative direction, it prints negative. And just for an example, if we change it to be one instead of six, this is what it looks like with only one tick. It's important to note that you cannot call the get crank ticks functions multiple times in the same update cycle, or you will have serious issues with the function. Look what happens if we run the code with three of the functions called here. It doesn't even work at all. Only the first time the console is logging, it logs for the positive direction but nothing else, and it does not increase the cube's speed. Now let's move on to something new. Get crank position returns the absolute crank position in degrees, so it will return a value between 0 and 359.999, which is basically 0 to 360 degrees. In this code example, I'm using get crank position to draw a kind of loading bar at the top of the screen based on the crank's position. This is accomplished by first dividing the crank position by 360 degrees to convert it into a percent. And then we use that value times 400, which is the screen's max width, to set the loading bar's width. Now let's cover some useful tricks the Playdate offers to add to the crank experience. First, I'll show you a script that will render the built-in animation indicating that the player needs to actively use the crank in your game. A few important things to note here. Our first, we had to import corelib slash UI and corelib slash timer. Both of those are needed for this. Then we had to set up the crank indicator by the start function and setting up if we wanted to spin clockwise or counterclockwise. And then in the update, we're checking if the crank is docked and only showing the indicator animation if it is docked. One more note, update timers must be called every frame to make sure the indicator animation is displayed correctly. And here's a look at what that animation is. This next line shows you how to disable the crank audio. This is what it sounds like before. And as you can see, there is no sound afterwards. The final thing I want to show you is an alternative way to read crank inputs that we've been reading all along. There are two alternative methods. The first one is using event callbacks, which you see on the screen now. 
And here are the same event functions handled by an event handler. And remember from the last episode that you have to push event handlers or they won't work. Running either the event callback or the event handler code will give you a game that looks like this. That's it for now. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Until next time.